practicing generally out of London, uh, but who we are fortunate to have this year as a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, in her practice, uh, she's engaged with many organizations, uh, but one of the things she does is lead the Global Media Legal Defense Initiative. Uh, I may have gotten that name slightly wrong. Uh, in litigation for the defense of journalists. And uh, she has won some path-breaking cases in the African regional courts, uh, which is the topic that she's going to be talking about today. The session that we're doing today uh, is being recorded. Uh, and so I want uh, you to know about that. Uh, we, she will be taking questions uh, later in, in the talk. But please bear in mind that the talk is being recorded on the other side when you want to make a comment or ask a question. Um, uh, our thanks to the Berkman Klein Center, I guess, for bringing uh, and the answer to them here, uh, those who are co sponsoring this talk, uh, and to HLS advocates for co sponsoring the talk. Uh, and without more, please join me in welcoming my dance in the bedrock. Thank you very much. I hope my microphone is working as it should. Yes. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, it's really wonderful to be speaking uh, with you today uh, about uh, the work that I've done at the, at the African Regional Courts. Um, I was asked to also give a little bit of context of the, of the systems that these courts operate in. However, I also want to make sure that I don't talk too long about things that I find interesting uh, and give you enough opportunity to ask questions. So I'll try to kind of stick to about 30 minutes or so and then we can do Q&A and perhaps you know, dive into certain things in a little bit more detail. So the three courts that uh, we'll be looking at uh, um, in the next few minutes are the African Court on Human and People's Rights, the East African Court of Justice, and the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice. And underneath you will see uh, the case names uh, of the cases that I've worked on. The odd one out of these three is uh, uh, the Federation of African Journalists and Others versus the Gambia, because that case is still pending. We're uh, awaiting a decision on, in that case uh, early next year. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background on the legal framework and within which the, these courts function. I'll then tell you something about the facts of the case, the strategy that we employed, and then of course what the outcome and impact uh, of those cases has been. And at the end, everything you always wanted to know about litigating at the African Regional Courts, but were afraid to ask. Um, I have um, a little, I was very proud that I managed to insert a, a video in my PowerPoint, but um, unfortunately there is no quick time here. So I shall take you to YouTube. Because this video, which was produced by UNESCO, um, neatly summarizes uh, the mandate of the African Court, uh, which uh, saves you from me listing uh, its characteristics. So.
That about sums it up. <laughs> um, go back to my slides. So you saw the key points already just now. Uh, it's a court based at uh, African Court on Human and People's Rights. It's based in Arusha, Tanzania, and has the possibility of actually issuing binding decisions on the application and interpretation of the African Charter. But not only the African Charter, it has also ruled on uh, violations of, for example, the ICCPR and the ECOWAS Treaty. Um, the, um, I will just kind of skip over this because we have, of course, it's not only dealing with press freedom cases, right? I mean, it has held on participation in elections and all sorts of other things, but the UNESCO video uh, focuses on the safety of journalists. So I will focus on uh, the case that you saw just featured uh, in the video, the one that dealt with imprisonment for defamation, and that's the case that we argued uh, with MLDI before the African Court uh, on Human and People's Rights. Mr. Konate um, is um, the, the owner and main contributor to a weekly newspaper called uh, L'Ouragan, which uh, is French for the hurricane in Burkina Faso. Uh, and at some point in time, he published uh, three articles that were very critical of a local public prosecutor, alleging that he uh, might have been involved in corruption. The pros public prosecutor was very unhappy with this, filed a criminal complaint, and uh, Mr. Konate was sentenced to a year imprisonment, uh, payment of fines and damages amounting to about 18 times the average annual salary in Burkina Faso, and his newspaper was suspended for half a year. Um, after this original, the initial judgment uh, came down, we got involved in the case and supported the appeal, meaning that we uh, basically financed uh, the lawyers who were taking the case uh, to the Court of Appeal, uh, tried to also provide some uh, legal advice, which was not really taken. Uh, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, uh, the initial conviction was upheld on appeal. Um, and then contacted the lead lawyer on the case and said, like, listen, what do you want to do? You're in Burkina Faso, you can go to the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice, and you can go to the African Court. Like, what show? Let's go. Um, the lawyer was like, well, you know, it will take too long, it's too complicated, I don't think so. Um, at which I replied, well, maybe your client feels differently. Uh, <laughs> so we, we found uh, someone who, would visit, who visited Mr. Konate in prison and asked him what he wanted to do. And he then authorized me directly to represent him at the African Court, uh, which is what we did. Um, this case uh, was very sensitive in a way because it was the first time that the African Court would get to deal with the issue of criminal defamation. As some of you may know, there's a campaign in various places in the world to decriminalize uh, uh, defamation. And in the African context, there is a very active campaign that is led by the African um, uh, Commission Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. Um, so there were a bunch of people who were quite concerned that you know, the court might not rule uh, the right way. Um, we uh, took the approach uh, that we wanted to get the court to understand that 
uh, consensus internationally was that imprisonment for defamation was not an acceptable penalty. So we presented the court with case law from its sister courts, from the European court and the Inter-American court, and also case law from the Commission, which, while not binding, is, of course, the one uh, body that had been consistently working on interpreting what Article 9, that's the article that protects the right to free speech in the African Charter, exactly meant uh, as regards states' obligations. So what we basically said to the courts, like, listen, this is the baseline. You can't go underneath this. You have to at least say that imprisonment for defamation is not an acceptable penalty. But you can be the most progressive human rights court and actually be the first one to say that criminal defamation as such violates the right to free speech. <laughs> Um, it was worth a try. <laughs> we almost got there, actually. Uh, four out of ten judges uh, agreed with us on, on that point. Um, and uh, I think that also shows like, what the potential is of the African court as, as, a, as a progressive uh, human rights court. Um, when kind of formulating our, our pleadings, um, we looked at how the African Commission cited case law from other courts and treaty bodies. So we found there, for example, that the Commission, when it looks at other regional courts, would look at the Inter-American Court first, and then at the UN Human Rights Committee, and then at the European Court, perhaps. So this is the same way that we kind of try to line up all of our arguments. So first going to the Commission, then Inter-American, and then UN Human Rights Committee, European jurisprudence. We didn't want to go there particularly because, you know, coming as an organization from London, like, look, here's the European Court, they do everything fantastically. We just wanted to kind of like make sure that it fit with the framework that was already there. Um, in the end, um, the courts, like I just mentioned, didn't go for the, for the, for the gold star, uh, but they did hold that uh, penalties for speech offenses had to be proportionate and that uh, imprisonment was never an acceptable penalty. Um, what was really interesting about the orders of the courts in the case was that besides ordering um, compensation to, Mr. Konate, uh, to be paid to Mr. Konate, which is something that we subsequently um, figured out in, in, in further filings and further proceedings, he was awarded the equivalent of about 70,000 US dollars uh, for loss of income and, uh, and moral <coughs> damages. Uh, which, when compared with other case law um, on reparations from the regional courts, isn't that bad. But as we within the team said, like, who would want to spend a year in a Burkina Bay prison for $70,000? Yeah. Um, however, um, besides uh, the compensation, the reparation uh, aspect, the court also explicitly ordered Burkina Faso to change its legislation. And it did so in, in, in a great level of detail. They said that um, the court uh, ordered Burkina Faso to amend their legislation on defamation to make it compliant with Article 9 of the Charter, Article 19 of the ICCPR, and Article 66 c of the ECOWAS Treaty by first repealing custodial sentences for acts of uh, defamation, and second, by adapting its legislation to ensure that other sanctions for defamation meet the test of necessity and proportionality. In, obligation, in, uh, in, um, sorry, in accordance with its obligations under the Charter and the ICCPR, which is very, very specific. Um, courts, international courts generally are a little bit reluctant, uh, in, in my experience, to be this precise in actually ordering states to um, legislate differently on certain issues. The wonderful thing here is that Burkina Faso actually followed the court's orders. Uh, last year, uh, the, um, the press law was changed. Um, um, imprisonment was scrapped as a penalty for defamation and all the, all the fines that were imposed for speech offences were lowered considerably. So that is really wonderful. <coughs> um, the payment to Mr. Konate is in process, uh, so we'll soon have full implementation of the case, uh, which I think is really lovely. Um, I should mention that as part of the strategy, we also uh, interested some uh, NGOs, some international and local NGOs, uh, to intervene as, as amici uh, in the case. Um, they also appeared in court, uh, so they could submit both in writing and also make oral arguments, which really helped kind of put the case on the map, I think, for the court also to, to kind of understand what was at stake. I um, have a couple of photos so you can see what it was like <laughs> at the court. Uh, this photo is of a the huge banner that was on the, on the gate uh, at the court's uh, premises. Um, the court is very active in its public outreach. Uh, hearings are open to the public, anyone can attend. Uh, and there's also a live uh, video stream of all the hearings. Uh, the live video stream also saves uh, all the previous live video streams. It's different from the YouTube channel that the court also has. Uh, th 
there you can find the reading of some judges, some judgments. Um, but if you if you Google live stream African courts, you can actually you know go and and, and watch previous hearings, um, including ours, if you want. Um, so this is us in the robing room, which is usually the reception, but um, now it was the robing room for us. That's me and my little Dutch. Uh, uh, lawyer's penguin outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Next to that, uh, uh, the late uh, John Jones QC of Dauter Street Chambers and uh, Stephen Finizia of Wilmer Hill. And next to that, Mr. Konate and an expert on Burkina Bay law. We had a, a procedural question as to whether or not the exhaustion of domestic remedies um, had been fulfilled uh, because there had been an option technically to file a cassation appeal, uh, which we argued uh, wouldn't have resolved the issue for him uh, and therefore uh, shouldn't be a requirement for the court. Um, I was very happy with the pro bono support that I got uh, from John and, uh, and Steve. Um, the original application <coughs> I filed on my own, uh, together with uh, two interns uh, in the summer of 2013. And then I was like, oh, this is actually kind of a big deal, so maybe <laughs> I should get some help <laughs> to make sure that I don't, don't mess up, right? Um, and it was great. So we did all the subsequent filings together, and we also appeared uh, in court together um, in, in March of 2014. Uh, this is us heading to the to the courtroom. This is the courtroom. It's huge. It's like a really big theater. And then you enter, and then there is a big podium on which there is a huge table for eleven judges, um, which you know is all rather imposing. The teeny tiny table that you see before it is where the registry uh, is seated. To the left uh, were we, and to the right uh, uh, were um, counsel for Burkina Faso. There are also transcribers there. Uh, everything gets transcribed. It also gets transcribed slightly imprecisely, so later on you get the transcripts, you have to really make sure to check that everything in there is, is correct. This is what, one of the th situations where it was really wonderful that we could work with a big law firm uh, such as Wilmer Hill, uh, because they had staff available to basically go back to those videos that I mentioned, to, who were on the live video link, listen to everything and make sure that everything got recorded uh, properly. Um, one of the things that happened actually when I was uh, at this robing room was that uh, one of the court staff members uh, came to, to greet us and uh, she said, okay, Nani Jans, he's like, oh, oh, I thought you, I thought you were a man. I said, well, uh, <laughs> I, um, I saw, because I saw your press release this morning, which quoted me as Mr. Jacare Ule Jansen, um, to which, at which point he, he turned to my client and said, did you know that she was a woman when you hired her? <laughs> And my client, without skipping a beat, is like, everybody knows that women are more conscientious than men. <laughs> um, but what I should say is that um, at the time when we argued the case, the president of the court was a woman, lead counsel for the applicant, that was me, was a woman, and lead counsel for Burkina Faso was a woman, which I think is something that's worth noting because it's not a setup that we see very regularly in international courts. And I still hope that that will change, but that was a, that was a good day, I think. <laughs> Um, the procedure before the court um, is perhaps worth mentioning. You go there, uh, you get to, um, you, you're received in the, in the office of the president of the court, who will then, you know, sit down both parties and explain exactly what's going to happen uh, that day. Uh, and what is going to happen is that each party gets 45 minutes to make their arguments, both on admissibility and the merits. In the first couple of cases that the court did, they split those two, so there was a separate hearing on admissibility and a separate one on the merits, but they now more efficiently combined those two. And that's it. You don't get rebuttal, you don't get surrebuttal, which I thought was really strange, because that's what I'm used to in a national context, right? Um, there was, in this case, because um, Burkina Faso decided to make a new argument during the hearing, namely that my client actually wasn't a journalist uh, because he didn't have a press card, which makes you wonder why he would have been convicted under the press law, uh, at which point the president gave us the opportunity to actually make counter arguments uh, on that point. So that, that was fun. Uh, the amici also got uh, time to present uh, their, um, their pleadings. Then uh, the whole court, everyone breaks for lunch. You come back and then all the judges get to ask you questions. So you basically go down the entire panel, they ask questions to both parties, which you scribble down really quickly, and then you come back the next day, and you each get 30 minutes to respond to those questions and also respond to the arguments that the other side made the previous day. And that's it. Um, so that's what the setup was. Um, there's not a lot of um, 
questions during oral argument, uh, I should say. So the, the judges kind of really save their questions until they come back uh, from lunch, basically. Um, judgment, um, the court does sensitization uh, missions. Uh, it wants more countries to make the declaration under Article 34.6 to allow for direct access to the court. So it visits, visits different African Union member states from time to time to kind of show them that the court is there, that it's doing great work, and basically encouraging them to make this declaration. In this situation, uh, in our case, they were in, happened to be in, in Addis at the time, so uh, in Ethiopia. So we were at the African Union uh, headquarters, and uh, our judgment was read in uh, the Nelson Mandela Plenary Hall. This is us looking very happy. This is before the judgment, actually. Um, I was actually quite sleep deprived. Um, Ethiopia, uh, I filed a bunch of cases against Ethiopia, so I wanted to be in the country as briefly as possible, because uh, they have no qualms, really, in arresting uh, NGO uh, people. Uh, so I flew in overnight, and I flew out overnight, which I can't recommend. Um, but anyway, uh, we all survived. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, our, our smiling photo turned out to be justified uh, in mm -hmm. the end. To kind of summarize what the court is like, um, I just mentioned that I think it's, it's a court that has great potential as a progressive human rights court. Um, I think that shows not only from the dissenting opinion that was there on the merits in our case, but also, for example, the, um, the order that was made on our request for provisional measures. What we basically argued was like, listen, he's clearly in, in jail on like really, for really the wrong reasons. Why don't you order him to be released while we hash this out here? should the state be right, you can always send them back to prison, which is something that would never fly at the European or the Inter-American Court, but here there actually was a handful of judges who thought that that argument was pretty reasonable. Um, so it's, there's a possibility there to kind of push, push the boundaries a little bit. It's really easily accessible, which I think is fantastic. You can file your submissions via email and then later on send like the, the signed originals via FedEx, so uh, it's, it's really low threshold, which is great. Um, the communications aren't always fabulous, but I have to say um, there are actually courts that are much worse, uh, to mention the European court for one. Uh, at least here there is a registry that you can email, you can pick up the phone and they will then tell you to send your email again and then you will get an answer. <coughs> but at the European court it's difficult to even get a human on the phone. So uh, in that sense it's pretty, pretty good. So I'll leave it at that and then we can talk about some other stuff having to do with this court later if you want. Um, the East African Court of Justice, also based in, in Arusha, Tanzania. Uh, Arusha is like the Hague of Africa, I guess, with all the international courts being based there. Um, it has jurisdiction over the partner states of the East African community, um, which is kind of a sub-regional uh, economic uh, community. Its, its, or, its origins are based on, on, on trade, uh, like the ECOWAS community, which we'll, we'll discuss in a moment. Um, what is notable of this court is that it doesn't have explicit human rights jurisdiction. Um, the protocol that should allow the court to get that uh, hasn't been ratified by the partner states. However, the court at some point was a bit like, well, you know, we're kind of tired of waiting uh, for this. Uh, this is my interpretation, that's not something anyone said, but um, let's look at our mandates in a progressive way. And what they've done is basically say, as long as you bring a human rights um, complaint there that is, that is combined with a complaint having to do with um, non-adherence to the treaty, they can consider it. So you can't go there saying, hi, article such and such of the, uh, for the, of the African Charter has been violated, but you can go there saying article 5, 6 or 7, which are usually the articles that are being used uh, to file a reference at the, at the East African Court of Justice, uh, have been violated and it also constitutes a violation of human rights. Uh, this was decided in the Katabazi case and has been consistently upheld by the court, which also has an appellate chamber, so that is consistent uh, case law. You do not need to exhaust domestic remedies um, when you go to the East African court, um, which is great, which makes it really quickly accessible. The only problem is, uh, it kind of detracts from that a little bit, is that you only have a two-month window to file a reference there. That's two months after the act or remission, uh, and the court has very um, strongly said that it doesn't acknowledge the concept of continuing violations. This has been hashed out thoroughly also on appeal, so you really have to be very, very quick. Um, 
it has delivered um, uh, decisions on, on issues such as habeas corpus, uh, freedom of expression, and also the right to a fair trial so far. But all of this under this header of uh, looking at uh, violations of the East African Community Treaty. The case that we uh, filed there uh, was against uh, Burundi, on behalf of the Burundi Journalist Union, uh, also in 2013. It was a busy summer. Um, Burundi, in the run-up to the elections, which we now all know kind of triggered all the, all, all the difficulties in the country at the moment, adopted um, a, a series of kind of repressive laws in the country, including uh, a very restrictive press law. Burundi's press law actually was pretty good uh, before that time, but now um, it allowed for prior censorship and things like that, uh, which the Burundi Journalist Union wasn't very happy with. They tried to challenge the law within the constitutional court there, but that only found in favor of the, the union on a couple of really technical points. So they were basically you know, wondering what to do next. The law got adopted in June, meaning that we had until, what was it again, 20-something August uh, to file a case. Um, what we did there was kind of employ a similar strategy as we did um, um, in the African courts uh, as regards to the case law that we cited. We tried to kind of put to the fore mostly case law that was from the region, so uh, Supreme Courts, Constitutional Courts, etc. Um, and uh, then also make some uh, comparisons with international bodies and what they had said about uh, the right to freedom of expression. And we took a two-prong approach in framing our, um, our case before the court. So I just mentioned that the court has accepted that it could take on human rights cases if you present them as a violation of the treaty. So Article 6 and 7, which were the ones that we focused on, um, describe what the underlying principles of the East African community are. So those are transparency, democracy, rule of law, good governance, and respect for international standards of human rights. So what we basically said was, listen, the free press is the cornerstone of the implementation of all of those principles. You can't have transparency without a proper functioning press. You can't have proper democracy and therefore also not proper rule of law. Good <coughs> governance, you need a good, you know, f a press that is able to do its job um, in order to have all these things. So that was the first argument that we made, which was kind of the, the Katabazi argument. Then we also tried to kind of get the court to be a little bit more bold um, in its uh, assertion of human rights jurisdiction. And then the second argument that we made is like, um, you know, Article 6 and 7 also state that there should be respect for international human rights standards. The right to freedom of expression is an internationally acknowledged human right. So therefore, this press law violates that right. Um, the courts didn't engage with that argument at all. Um, it did engage with the first one, though. Um, one of the things that um, was really interesting in seeing how the court looked at the case was that it had, that it was challenging for, for them to kind of consider the law in abstract. Again, I should say there, the court is not alone uh, there. Uh, a lot of international courts find it difficult to just kind of look at the text of a law without a concrete violation that, you know, that can be attached to it, that makes it come alive, right? Um, but they did find a number of, uh, of articles clearly uh, in violation of the community principles on the face of it, uh, including, for example, um, on the protection of, of sources. Um, there, again, here there was also a group of amici um, that, that intervened in the case. Oh, sorry. I wanted to say here, um, to the left, uh, from the back, you see Donald Dea, who is the president of the Pan-African Lawyers Union. He was the advocate uh, that actually argued the case in court. Uh, at the African courts, I could appear myself. Uh, the, the rules of procedure don't have any requirements of having to be admitted to a uh, bar of, a, of, a, of an African Union member state. I'm admitted to the bar in the Netherlands, so not, not really close to the AU uh, at all. But that is not a problem there. Um, East African uh, Community Court of Justice, though, you have to be admitted to the bar of a partner state, so we needed to work with local council to do this. I also should say that the moment that we got Don on board, who is a seasoned uh, advocate in the East African Court and also at the African Court, things started going a lot more smoothly for us. Um, it was very difficult to get our filing in. Um, the, the East African Court doesn't have the world's most transparent and precise rules of procedure. And they also seem to interpret them differently at uh, different occasions. So uh, <laughs> with this two-month deadline uh, looming, um, 
we had someone in Arusha who went to the registry repeatedly uh, with our reference, only to be sent back with like, yeah, yeah, you forgot to put numbers here. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, the signature is on the right, it has to be on the left, uh, things like that. And then at some point we even got like a hand-corrected copy of like how the, for what the formatting should look like exactly. Um, this is interesting, by the way, because this is actually where you see that you can be blocked by the bureaucracy rather than the court itself. Because there is actually a case law from the court in which someone filed a reference there but named the document, gave the document the wrong title or something, which was then used by the respondent state as an excuse to try and get the case thrown out, in which the court said, well, I can see exactly what the intention of this document is. Like, let's skip all the formalities here. Um, so that was difficult. Uh, when we finally implemented all of those corrections that were given, um, the person at the registry was like, oh, I'm not sure if you can have footnotes in a reference. <laughs> but, you know, the, the ambiguity of the rules of procedure notwithstanding, uh, there was nothing uh, in there that precluded us from filing it. So um, the case finally took off, um, so that was wonderful. But once we had done there, um, all of that disappeared. So uh, that was wonderful. Um, the summary of that case, sorry, I should tell you something about the procedure. <coughs> it's, um, it's different from the African courts in the sense that there you do all your uh, filings with the registry. They kind of lead the process. Uh, in the East African Court of Justice, you have to, for example, serve all your filings on the opposing party yourself. So it's not like you send it into the registry, the registry makes sure that it gets uh, distributed. So there's a lot more um, legwork involved there, which, which makes it more tricky. Um, anyway, so what I just described says something about the accessibility. <coughs> it's, a, it's a little bit more difficult uh, to get things sorted there. I should say that it's, uh, it's much easier, of course, when you're actually in, in the partner states. Um, <coughs> every partner state has a sub-registry where you can file. So if you're a, a lawyer from Uganda wanting to seize the court, you can go to the sub-registry in Kampala and do all your filings there, etc. Um, the court may be a little bit more conservative, which is, I think, understandable in light of the fact that it doesn't have explicit human rights jurisdiction. So it has a bit of a balancing act to do, right? Um, uh, with kind of, kind of maintaining the buy-in of the partner states while at the same time also wanting to, you know, um, deliver good judgments in, 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 in human rights issues. Um, one of the things that I should say, though, which is really wonderful, is that you can get accelerated proceedings at the court. So if you have a really urgent matter, uh, you, this would actually be the place to get things done really quickly. Um, the court is always open, basically, whereas the African court sits only in sessions and actually also hasn't figured out yet quite how to operate in between those sessions. Meaning that when there are actually urgent things, it, it's kind of difficult to, to get uh, something done there. The ECOWAS Community Court of Justice is a, a, a photo from inside the courtroom um, in Abuja, Nigeria. Um, it has jurisdiction over all um, uh, 15 member states of the ECOWAS community, uh, which also started again as an economic uh, uh, community, sub-regional one. Uh, the court has explicit human rights jurisdiction. It's a pretty solid um, court. Like the um, uh, many human rights courts, it also faced challenges at some point with states threatening to, to leave uh, because they, uh, they didn't really appreciate uh, being told off on, on their human rights records. Uh, but the court survived that and it actually kind of, I think, became all the stronger uh, for it. Uh, they're currently <laughs> considering installing an appeals chamber as well, uh, which is great. Um, you also do not have to exhaust uh, domestic remedies there. And um, the point that I listed there about the time limit is something that's actually going to be clarified um, in the case that we filed. Um, so far, the general consensus has been that the court maintains a three-year time limit for filing uh, human rights uh, <coughs> violations, uh, claims about human rights violations, because it also can hear other matters, right? It can interpret community law also on economic issues, etc. Um, but actually, when we did our hearing on admissibility in, in, in Abidjan earlier this year, it was one of the issues that the judges very much zoomed in on. We argued uh, continuing violations for some of our, our, our clients, 
Um, and uh, of course, um, our, uh, the respondent state argued that you know none of that should apply, and we're, they were just way too late. Uh, and then the judges really zoomed in on the question as to whether or not they actually themselves, the court, and others had been interpreting their own rules uh, correctly on that front. So we have to wait and see what happens. But uh, if they actually throw that open, that basically would make the ECOWAS court the most the, the Human Rights Court with the most broad mandate um, uh, on this front, allowing for uh, human rights claims to come years after they uh, have been committed. But let's see uh, what happens there. Um, the case, um, Federation of African Journalists and others, the others are uh, a number of journalists from the Gambia who are now all in exile um, uh, in different places, some in Africa, some outside of Africa. Uh, it was a, it's, a, it's a, again a freedom of expression case. Um, the right to freedom of expression, we argue, uh, has been violated by prosecution under criminal defamation, false news and sedition laws uh, in the country. Um, we basically argue that um, they are also not able at this point in time to practice their journalism in a way that they would have been able to had they still been in their, in their home context. There's of course the obvious um, uh, issue of them, them not being too, uh, able to return to their home place to begin with. And in addition to that, there, is, uh, there are two torture claims uh, in the case as well of journalists who have been tortured while in custody um, by the National Security Services there. Um, we filed the case in December last year, yeah, December 2015. Um, we had a hearing on admissibility in April, which I think was fantastically quick. And um, that, that I participated in, actually, that was in, uh, in Abidjan. <laughs> um, that is uh, our, uh, one of the lawyers from our team, uh, Noah Ajare, who is based in Abuja, in Nigeria. We basically had a team of, of us at MLDI, together um, with uh, Jen uh, Yeginsu and Anthony Jones um, in London, two barristers who wanted to work with us pro bono on this matter and uh, two lawyers in Nigeria, so Noah and, and, and Angela. And we also worked together with an academic, uh, Lawrence Helfer of Duke University, who had been studying these regional courts for years. Um, the court's case law is not super accessible because not all of it ends up on the website, so a lot of it kind of has to be, like you have to be lucky that you can get a bunch of judgments from other people who have been practicing there. So it's really wonderful to have had someone on board there who actually had a pretty good overview of what, of what the court had and hadn't decided on before, particularly with all the procedural uh, issues that, that come into play, uh, such as continuing violations, yes or no. Um, so we, we had a hearing in Abidjan. I, so I managed to appear alongside uh, uh, Mr. Ajare there, uh, who is admitted to uh, the bar in Nigeria. Uh, I still am not admitted to the bar in any African Union member state, but because I you know, could kind of tag along with him, uh, we were able to, to appear together. Um, the judges were very inquisitive. Uh, it was a panel of three. Uh, they were very active. They clearly had um, a very clear idea of what they wanted the discussion to focus on. Uh, so they, you know, they, they peppered both us and uh, the respondent state uh, with lots of questions. Um, which was both fun and uh, a little bit uh, intimidating at times. Uh, the presiding judge was very unhappy with the fact that we had submitted so much paper uh, in the case. Um, the rules of procedure basically say that you know, whenever you make a filing, you have to annex the, the source of law that you are um, relying on. So we had our, um, we had our, uh, our, our application, but then we also had a number of witness statements uh, to present in evidence, each of which also had annexes. So there were loads of binders uh, um, that were all brought to Abidjan also, and uh, I think that they were a little bit unhappy with, uh, with all the paper. <laughs> they was like, can we just please have no more paper? I said, okay, okay fine. <laughs> so we tried to kind of uh, um, make sure that we didn't file too much uh, uh, after that. Um, so I can't say too much now, of course, about the outcome of the case, because we'll have to wait and see. Um, the court will decide on both admissibility and the merits at a date to be determined. We're hoping, it, we're hoping that it will be at the beginning of the, of the coming year. Uh, what we're also hoping is that um, the court will include a little bit more language on uh, the legal principles. Um, 
the ECOWAS court has a page limit of 15 pages for its judgments, which may be the reason why it tends to focus very much on the facts in the case when it hands down a judgment. And while it has handed down other decisions having to do with journalists and um, in the Haidara case uh, explicitly referenced the right to freedom of expression in Article 9 of the African Charter, we try to kind of frame our application in a way that we both kind of like focus on the factual reasons why uh, the court should find in favor of our clients, but also trying to kind of like maybe elicit some more, uh, um, yeah, principled language from the court, which would be very helpful uh, to use in a national context in the di different ECOWAS community member states in national proceedings. So we'll have to see if, that, if that's going to work out. The court is fairly accessible um, if you have a local partner. Um, I think the reason, one of the reasons why we actually managed to get a hearing so quickly was because the lawyers we work with in Abuja were just so really well connected with the court. They litigated there all the time. They knew exactly how the registry worked. They knew how to find out information, which was just, yeah, really, really helpful. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, um, um, it's, it's good to have the, have the right team there. Um, progressive, I don't know. So this is a little bit difficult because there's not a lot of overt reasoning or statements of, 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 of principles, etc., in their, in their judgments. But overall, the sense that you get is that the court is very uh, rights-minded and very pragmatic. Um, like I said, the judgments aren't that long, so it's, it, it's something to kind of worth looking at. Um, if you're interested in a press freedom case, uh, the Haidara judgment is, is, a, is a good one uh, to start with. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and we'll leave it to you to ask me questions. Yes, please. How well do the member states um, adhere to the judgments that are made in these courts? When, when, when the judgment goes against the state, are they, are they obeying the judgment? Um, it's difficult to kind of say something very general. I think with the different courts, it, it, it differs. Um, the ECOWAS court has been struggling a little bit with its implementing, implementation uh, mechanism. And of course, uh, the Gambia is notorious uh, for not implementing uh, judgments handed down against it. Though there are... Um, there are, they are, not, are they not a member of the, any of these jurisdictions? They are. Uh, the Gambia falls within the ECOWAS uh, community. So there are, there are three previous decisions against the Gambia that have to do with, with journalists, and none of those have been implemented uh, by them so far. There are plenty of other examples, however, on, on other issues. Um, there's a famous uh, judgment uh, against Niger having to do with slavery that has been implemented. Um, and at the African court, there's only just still a couple of judgments. Um, but um, ours has been now almost implemented in full. We're just waiting still for the, for the payment to be completed. Uh, in the Zongo case, um, the, 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 um, the orders were to pay compensation. That has happened. Um, so I don't think it's, yeah. I think overall the picture is actually fairly positive. But I think that's a general, a general issue that a lot of people tend to be very pessimistic about the implementation of international judgments, whereas mm -hmm. If you look at the overall picture, it's, it's more looking at what types of measures are being implemented. Generally speaking, paying compensation is not that hard for a state to do. So they tend to actually comply with that. Um, however, the legislative change and all of these things, which you know, usually uh, you know, require a lot of investment from a state because you have to go into the whole legislative process, are the ones that are, that are more difficult. How did you, can you talk about Konate and, and how you decided to, to pursue that? What were the factors you had to consider? What are, I mean, the kind of work that he was doing. You know, there's a lot of people all over the world who do, do a lot of journalism and some of it's really good and some of it kind of sucks. <laughs> or it doesn't, it, it won't help you if you're gonna try to, you know, if something happens and then you need to you know, it's, you wouldn't be a good candidate mm. for this kind of litigation. So yeah. I'm sort of curious, just how do you, how do you, would you decide to go for that? And, um, and what's it like sort of showing up as coming from, you know, elsewhere? Yeah. Saying, oh, well, here I am. Those are a couple of really interesting questions. Um, first of all, we, we supported the case within the domestic system already, right? So MLDI doesn't make um, 
any selection in that sense, other than just the regular vetting proceedings, which is just like, okay, does it not constitute hate speech or incitement to violence, those types of things. Because um, we, we did a lot of regular case support. Um, why this turned into a strategic case? Um, I think because of the, the, the expressed wish uh, by a number of prominent actors that the court actually hand down a judgment on this point. Um, the special rapporteur had at uh, various occasions said, like, someone needs to take a case to the court. We need the court to speak out on this matter. And then looking at the, at the facts in the case, you know, the, the penalty was so disproportionate. The journalism um, wasn't like the most fabulous in the world, but it by no means merited this type of heavy-handed um, criminal sanctions, right? So we basically made a, a, a judgment call on like, do, do we think that we can win this? And that, yeah, that was pretty clearly a, a, a green light. I'm sorry, I forgot what the, oh, how it, what, what it was like to show up uh, there, yeah. Um, so I did, I did visit the court before actually appearing there um, because I thought it was important that um, the court was aware that we're not, that we weren't like storming in there you know, guns blazing, coming from London, like, look at us, here we are to, to tell you how you should do your human rights work. Mm -hmm. So I, I did request a, a meeting with the registry uh, because I had to be in Arusha for something else. Um, and, 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 and I met with the registrar to just kind of, you know, be polite and show my face. And um, I mean, we didn't discuss the case, but we just like to kind of show that we were there in a, in a, in a respectful uh, manner. Um, and I think, <coughs> Yeah, anyway, it, it, it went well, uh, also the communications with the courts. We, yeah, we didn't get any flack for that either afterwards or anything like that, so at least not openly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you for talking to us today. I think that uh, the implementation of these courts is a great step towards the protection of human rights. But uh, in your point of view, what would be the next goal to try to achieve for other countries to stay in that direction? Um, so one of the things that I, uh, I, I struggled with a little bit was that there wasn't a, a coordinated effort to just kind of use the president nationally, right? Um, I've had some really nice anecdotal uh, examples of the Konate case being used in national context, even at the Supreme Court of India, which I thought was, was the nicest, <laughs> almost of all, um, in, a, in a challenge to the criminal defamation laws there. But, um, so I, I mentioned this decriminalization of defamation campaign, which is something that's ongoing, but it's really difficult to kind of coordinate all these different actors throughout the continent without sufficient funding, without you know, sufficient steering uh, from a local actor also. <coughs> and one of the things that, because all this time everyone was saying like, okay, we need to get good case, so we need to get good case law. And I was like, okay, uh, let's go, right? Um, but yeah, what you then need actually is someone who can take charge and make a plan. Like, okay, which countries can we file constitutional challenges or which countries should we monitor to kind of follow up on this? Um, one nice follow-up is at the East African Court of Justice, actually, uh, by um, uh, an organization that we also work with at MLI, uh, Human Rights Network for Journalists, Uganda, who filed an application or a reference, sorry, at the East African Court of Justice challenging the criminal defamation laws in Uganda based on the Konate case and the Burundi case, um, which is a really nice way of, of bringing those two together. And this is, I hope, yeah, I hope it has a good chance because there's an individual plaintiff who had been convicted under the criminal defamation law. So unlike our slightly abstract challenge, which basically um, set the stage because the court acknowledged that it has jurisdiction to look at press freedom cases, um, we have an individual plaintiff there um, you know, who can actually make that claim. But yeah, I think in the end, the key thing is like, not only forcing uh, actual <coughs> implementation of these decisions, but then also using them as a tool for litigation and campaigning. I mean, the litigation is not the only answer, I mean, uh, but um, it can be used as a, as a good example uh, for national uh, institutions to, to change their laws and, uh, and their practices, I think. Kate was next. It was actually a quick follow-on to um, well, Ellery's question about the, the contract case. When you, you mentioned that you were asked, one of the questions was, 
you know, is this person a journalist? And that whole rabbit hole of what constitutes journalism um, and, and a journalist that affords them the right of that level of protection. And I'm wondering if you could say how you responded to that and if that has become a question in many of these other cases. Um, so I, I responded to that by first of all pointing out that they themselves thought he was a journalist because they prosecuted him under the press law. Um, and then I also explained that uh, holding a press card in and of itself isn't the determining factor there, pointing to the Inter-American Commission's advisory opinion on uh, mandatory membership, uh, etc. Um, so that was it in a nutshell uh, <laughs> that, I, that I, yeah, when I put forward there. Uh, you and then you. <laughs> um, it's really interesting that you mentioned the Supreme Court of India because it just last year it upheld the criminalization. Of yeah, it unfortunately didn't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that my friends were involved in that litigation and yeah. they were sort of pretty uh, mad about it from the beginning because yeah. they couldn't see any sort of headway, uh, making any headway at the time. But I'm just wondering what, um, how do you view uh, the so how do the social justice movements or uh, progressive movements in different sort of African countries view the role of these uh, of these human rights courts that are sort of supranational human rights courts? Is it a forum that they are willing and ready to go to whenever they do a violation or are they more apprehensive about it? Like where does it fit in with their strategy? Um, I think overall the, the, the view uh, of these institutions is, is, is positive. Uh, I think though that um, there's not always uh, full awareness of what the options are, right? Uh, how to go about it also. I think there's, there's a slight access to justice uh, issue um, also in, in kind, of, kind of making sure that there's sufficient awareness of the possibility to claim rights before these courts. Um, but also I think that, that some of them actually are quite difficult to, to deal with. Um, if, you're, if you're a smaller organization with, with, uh, with fewer resources, right? Um, it's, it's not that easy to then somehow get a filing in, in Arusha. What do you do if you have to show up for a hearing? You have to travel there still. Like you can't, you can't go to the sub-registry and make, you, make your <coughs> argument there. Um, so there are definitely s s some problems there, and I think in that sense, bodies like the Commission, where most of the arguing goes on paper, are actually much lower threshold uh, than some of these courts. Excuse me. You mentioned, in, I think it was in Kauai, that some NGOs and weights are following that question, that some NGOs uh, intervened and uh, even, I think, argued. Um, was that, is that uh, already common practice or was it unusual in that case? Uh, um, and and is, are there any uh, NGOs that are uh, uh, specialized in um, um, practice or intervention of any kind before the courts? And if not, would that help? And then a completely different question, if you don't mind, has, uh, Several countries in Africa are now attempting to withdraw from the ICC. Uh, what relationship does that have to the possibility of using regional courts? Uh, obviously, it's a completely different body of or bodies of law. But is that some some opportunity, paradoxically, to bolster the regional court? Okay. So on the on the Amicus uh, practice first. Um, <coughs> The one case in which a request had been made and granted uh, in filing an amicus brief before the Konate case was in uh, one of the Libya cases. And there are two, and I'm sorry that I always mix up the names, so, but anyway, there's, that is the case that actually didn't go through because in the end no one showed up and no one made any further filings. There's another one in which a decision has been handed down earlier this year, but that's not the one I mean, the other Libya case. So. Um, this is the first time that it actually was put into practice. Um, uh, they requested to make uh, oral arguments, which the courts granted, which I think was great, because uh, I think it's really good to kind of make sure that all those submissions are, are given a voice. I know that subsequent uh, requests for amicus briefs have been made. I'm not aware exactly of like how many and what the status of all of those is. Um, 
the Victoire in Gabira case, that, which I looked at recently, uh, a request had been made and it has been opposed, but I'm not quite sure what the, what the outcome there is. But um, if there are NGOs that are specialized in that, um, well, MLDI will lead a bunch of uh, amicus coalitions. Um, so for example, in, in the case that you, against Uganda that was brought at the East African Court of Justice that I just mentioned, uh, we, we led a, a coalition of NGOs uh, to make a request there to, to file an amicus brief that is all still in the works because uh, it's been vigorously opposed by the Attorney General uh, of, of Uganda. Um, but um, I, think, I think in principle those things sh shouldn't be that hard but again it's one of those things where you just kind of need to know how to do it. You need to have a proper look at the, <laughs> at the rules of procedure and you need to find someone who's able to draft you know, a, a proper document for you that meets the requirements. Uh, and there are definitely people out there who want to do it. I don't think there's anyone centrally coordinating that but making it all a little bit haphazard perhaps and um, to a certain extent it leaves it a little bit to the parties to kind of nudge others uh, to see if they're interested. Does that answer your question? Okay, um, and the other question was about the ICC. No. So there are there are three protocols establishing three different courts under the African Charter. So there's the African Court on Human and People's Rights, which we just talked about. Then there's the African Court of Justice, and then there's the African Court of Justice and y Human Rights, which is the one that would have criminal jurisdiction if it gets sufficient ratifications which is not the case yet. I think only five so far, uh, five states so far have ratified that protocol. Uh, there's been a lot of debate uh, on that court and particularly on the issue of uh, immunity for heads of state. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think to be very pragmatic, um, better, better a court with slightly more limited criminal jurisdiction that operates regionally than one that no one <laughs> is willing to uh, submit to the, the jurisdiction of. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure how, how, how quickly that's, that is going to go. I think it's really important to you know, kind of keep in mind with all of these things is that it's, uh, it's a subsidiary jurisdiction, right, of these international criminal courts. So they're not supposed to kick in other than when crimes are not being prosecuted nationally which would be like the first choice, uh, always, but, um, yeah. Well, now you see why I'm so happy to be here today. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking you. Thank you very much. I um, Just for whoever is, is really keen on uh, g having info on this, I'm happy to share my slides for anyone who sends me an email. I also uh, had a little handout on the details on the different courts. And I'm giving a talk tomorrow for which I also made a little overview of the different courts' case law on uh, press freedom, kind of highlighting what the different findings are and the different standards that you can distill from it. So. I wanted to print it, but the printer at the Berkman Klein Center uh, broke down yesterday. <laughs> but if you if you if you want to have it, just uh, send me an email, and, uh, and I'm happy to, to send it over to you if you find it useful.